All right, welcome everybody to the podcast where we're doing our uh, first 500 year series of the history of the church. If you guys like the content that we're doing, make sure that you like and subscribe, and then make sure you also hit the bell uh, so that you can get the notifications every time that we release yep. new content. Um, I'm super excited for this this episode. There's something about diving into this aspect of John's theology yep. and John's view of Jesus and, and everything that just blows my mind. Yep. And it's just like one mind-blowing thing after another. It almost opens up the entire Bible. Uh, for you. Yeah, as we've been, been explaining, we've 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 stopped a little bit here and concentrated on John because a lot of the, of, of the theology that John covers, it's going to start to show up in the second century, and he has this mm-hmm. wide influence. So we talked about John, you know, his upbringing, his bio, his biography, basically, um, why he's considered the great theologian of the evangelists. Um, we've traced um, why we think the tradition is absolutely correct when it comes to authorship of the gospel and the Book of Revelation, all of that. But we mentioned last time that there's a lens to read John with yeah. beyond just John's a theologian or John's an evangelist. Or the seer. Yeah. Or the or the seer. Um, and so this episode is going to concentrate on that lens, how we can read John to come to a deeper understanding of John's theology and his his um, um, his idea of what Jesus' ministry was all about. Yeah. And that is John the priest, in yeah. a way, right? Um, so we, we typically don't think of St. John the Apostle in priestly terms, mm-hmm. or, or even as a priest. But remember, we said, just kind of dig into the, the evidence of it, we said that Polycrates, Bishop Polycrates, way in the second century, right, um, writes about John being a priest. Yeah. He refers to him as wearing the, um, the turban, the priestly, the high priestly turban. Um, and so... In tradition, already in the city of Ephesus, John was considered um, as a priest. Now, do we accept the fact that John was a high priest? Maybe not, but right. but the idea is that the tradition remembered him in those terms. Yeah, remembered him as a as a priest um, wearing the high priest's turban. So you have that first witness of John. It's also interesting in the Gospel of John, we're told that among all the apostles, it's only John who knows. The high priest and the and the high priestly family. Yeah, yeah, and that's he's able strange. to gain access mm-hmm. to the priest and to the high priest himself. So it's it's odd that John, uh, the son of Zebedee, who just would come from the fishing village and maybe had a good business, but mm-hmm. to know the high priest, yeah, to have an in an ear with the high priest. And we had mentioned that he had, he he has some episodes in his gospel where it's like if you didn't know someone in the priesthood, you wouldn't have known that that conversation took place among the Sanhedrin. Right, and you wouldn't right. know that Nicodemus had come out, you know, or how did Nicodemus even gain access to Christ? And mm-hmm. it's pretty clear that's like, well, it's John might be the one who's mm-hmm. bringing Nicodemus to Christ. Yeah, that's right. And then <clears throat> then you have these other connections. Remember we said that um uh, if you connect all four gospels, you can come to the conclusion that Salome is yeah. not only John's mother, but that Salome is the sister of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And if Salome is the, the sister of the Virgin Mary, potentially, uh, that means that both Salome and Mary are related to Elizabeth, yeah, um, St. John the Baptist's mother. And what does it say about Elizabeth? It says that um, Elizabeth is a descendant of the daughters of Aaron, right. which means she comes from a priestly family. Now, we don't know about St. John's father, Zebedee, if mm-hmm. he was a priest or not. But if he was, then that would be that would mean that both John's um, John's <laughs> aunt Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to the connection. <laughs> John's aunt Elizabeth um, and his uncle would have been of priestly lines. But we don't know of Zebedee. We don't know too much about him. But it's possible. Yeah. But there are these priestly connections um, that are that are there. The other thing you can point out, and it's interesting, if you do a word study of um, the name John, mm-hmm. so when you come to the Second Temple period, the name John, when it most, when it appears, it is most often associated with somebody who's a priest. Yeah. And the famous example, of course, would be St. John the Baptist. Yeah. St. John the Baptist, people forget, was a priest. Yeah, because it's interesting, because in that, in that whole episode where uh, his father has to give a name to the child... You know, he he chooses the name John, and they say, whoa, 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 like, nobody in your family is really named that. Are you sure? And he said, his name is John, mm-hmm. you know, designated him. Like, he's, he's, he's a priest. Yeah, so in the majority of times in the Second Temple period, at least, when that name shows up, it's associated with, with a priestly person or a priestly family. Mm-hmm. So there's no, another kind of maybe indication. Um, 
the other indication would be that he's the follower, again, of John the Baptist, who yeah. was this priest. And John the Baptist, we know, was a priest because his father was a priest. Zechariah served in the temple. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all these maybe little connections that you can make and say, St. John the Apostle perhaps was a priest. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. But put all that aside, even. Mm-hmm. Even if he wasn't a priest himself, he has associations with priestly families through Elizabeth. Um, he has certainly a pre, uh, association with priests through St. John the Baptist. Remember we said that John the Apostle is one of the first followers and apparently a very um, ardent follower of John the Baptist who was a priest. Yeah. And because we had mentioned the Essene influence of, um, on, not only because of John the Baptist, but John himself has really adopted this Essene theology very at a very early age. Even if he's not a priest, the lens through which he is seeing the gospel, the, the lens through which he's beginning to see Christ in his ministry, we're going to show in this yes, episode, and... is through this priestly mm-hmm. lens. Yep. His, his entire view of Jesus, his entire view of what the church is about, what we're doing here, mm-hmm. like what is the purpose of this mm-hmm. whole Christian thing, he he defines it solely, almost solely in priestly terms. Mm-hmm. And now the ever so provocative title of this episode is that uh, G- it's Jesus and the Secrets of the Temple. So unbeknownst maybe to many people who just have a cursory read of the Bible is that in the old temple cult in, in ancient Israel, mm-hmm. there was this whole demarcation between the priesthood and the actual people. Um, and they were they were differentiated based on the fact that the priests participated in the things of the Lord. In Deuteronomy, we hear that it it literally says, the secret things belong to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But to us, it says, belong the law and the the ethics. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, you sort of had this two-tiered division of Israel. Where you have the priests who have access to the things and the secrets to of the, the theology, Lord, yep. the theology of the temple, and then the people don't really know all the rituals of what go what goes on in there and what they mean. Um, yeah, and because, that's well, because remember in the in the old cult that um, Israelites weren't allowed in <laughs> yeah. to the to the tent to the temples. None of that. Only priests were. Yeah, and so we can surmise and that the, the the priests when they would get together, these are some of the things they would discuss are the secrets mm-hmm. and what the meaning of this and. But not with the people. To the people, it was it was satisfying enough that they would have the law, mm-hmm. um, and the and the ethics um, yeah. of the the Israelite religious life. So when we come to to Jesus, Jesus is consistently, especially in John's Gospel, hinting at the fact that he ha- he know he has access to the mysteries of God, mm-hmm. um, that he knows something because he was in the bosom of the Father, and he's sharing these things. And we see um, echoes of this in John chapter 3, verse 11 through 13, when he, he, he basically says that I'm the one who came from heaven, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he says, amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? There you go. And, and see, it's hearing, a priest hearing that, a temple priest hearing that would say, well, what kind of access do you have mm-hmm. to, to the temple secrets and the mysteries? Mm-hmm. Um, so Jesus is clearly claiming to be a priest at that point. Yeah. Um, but further than that, you have it corroborated by uh, a really, really striking verse in um, the gospel of Luke. So in Luke uh, chapter eight, verse 10, he says to you, to the apostles, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, they get just parables, which is, basically what happened in Israel. It's like the yeah. priests knew the secrets and the people knew the, the ethical things. And that's all that Jesus' parables are, yeah. the ethics. And so Jesus is saying to his apostles, to his inner group um, of priests, yeah. um, that he's going to reveal to them the secrets of what he has seen and what he has heard in mm-hmm. the heavenly places. Yeah. So that's the, that's the secrets of temple theology. So um, why don't you kind of run us through what is temple theology? What, what's the gist of it? Well, at least one aspect of it we can go through, and that is the idea of the high priest and uh, the day of day of atonement. Really, mm-hmm. um, the the idea is you have to look at the the symbology of the temple. But the high priest himself uh, typically wore white along with the other priests. Okay, but on the day of atonement, something else happened. Yeah, 
on the Day of Atonement, the, the high priest of the temple, the old temple, the, the first temple mm-hmm. we're, we're really speaking of, he would put on the vestment, okay, a certain vestment, and then he would um, uh, do the sacrifice. But before he did that, anytime he went into what we call the Holy of Holies, the most inner place of the temple, he would take off that, that outer vestment, garment, that outer garment, yeah, and he would go into the Holy of Holies dressed all in white. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Catholics should basically already be familiar with what we're going to say about what it means to be in white, right? It means it symbolizes purity and all those things, but it also symbolizes the angelic life or or yeah. uh, being uh, angelified, if you want to say. Yeah. Um, so when and, they, and I mean that, and that's evidence all throughout the scriptures, where every time that you see an angel, they're dressed in white, and they right. they make they make sure to mention he's dressed in white, he's dressed in white, he's dressed in white. Well, that's because of this temple theology, mm-hmm. where when the high priest would enter into the holy of holies, he became like an angel, yes. and so he would remove the outer garment, yeah. which begs the question: What is this outer garment? <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. The outer garment uh, matched the exact coloring and and linens and wool of the veil of the temple. Mm-hmm. So the veil, so if so, people can picture this in their minds, the veil that would separate the the, the innermost, if you remember when we talked about the, 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 the temple, it's a series of concentric squares. The, 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 the innermost square is the Holy of Holies and only the high priest can go in there. Then there's a veil and outside of that is the sanctuary. And we mentioned in our, in our first century mass episode that that's where Christians believe they are when they're worshiping is in the mm-hmm. sanctuary while Jesus is in the Holy of Holies as high priest. So that veil then now yeah so the high priest puts on that veil well what what does that veil represent then i mean because you have vestments for some reason they have to have some mm-hmm. kind of symbolism well we get a little <laughs> revealing of the secret from josephus mm-hmm. uh, the first century jewish writer who was himself from a priestly family mm-hmm. um, he says the curtain was a babylonian curtain embroidered with blue and fine linen and scarlet and purple and of a contexture that was truly wonderful. Nor was this mixture of colors without its mystical interpretation. Okay, so here's a great example of, at this time, uh, Jewish priestly teaching. So he is actually, in a way, he's kind of being a jerk because he's, yes. he's revealing yeah, the because secrets because of the temple. he's revealing sec- secrets of the, of the symbology. <laughs> yeah. And Josephus across the board is, is usually a jerk. He's right. a traitor. <laughs> he was a traitor to his own country. So. Right. But he says, here's the mystical interpretation of the veil. For by the scarlet there seemed to be an enigmatically signified fire. By the fine flax, the earth. Mm-hmm. By the blue, the air. And by the purple, the sea. What Josephus is telling us is that the veil of the temple refers to matter. To the, the elements. To the things that have been created. Mm-hmm. To the elements of the earth. To the ancients, there are four elements. It represents the elements. So what do you think it means then when the priests high priest vestment is the same linen, the same colors, Mm -hmm. and he puts it on. So if we're saying the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and is angelic or deified even, Mm -hmm. and he comes through the veil, puts on the veil, basically, puts on matter, and then goes and makes sacrifice. Who does that remind everybody of? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. We'll see what John has to say. John's interpretation of of what's going on here. The other thing about the secret theology of this temple, not only is the high priest, quote unquote, deified in the Holy of Holies, or he's angelic at least, Mm -hmm. and he comes through the veil, puts on the vestment, the incarnation. Remember, the high priest is also wearing the turban. And on the turban is the name of God, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who know Old Testament theology and name theology, When Solomon built the first temple, it says that he built the temple so that the name of the Lord would reside there. The name is always associated with the presence of God himself. Right. So imagine the high priest. He keeps his turban on. He has the name Yahweh written on his foreheads. He enters the Holy of Holies. He's deified. He is like Yahweh. He's wearing the name. Yep. He's wearing the presence. Yep. He comes through. Now he's Yahweh vested. Now look, he's coming from the heavenly from court. From the heavenly court. Through reality, through through material reality. And then next thing you know, he's wearing it. He's Yahweh <laughs> vested. Yeah. And then going to the altar. So you have what's going on here is a theology of incarnation. Incarnation. Right. Incarnation coming from the angelic 
celestial realm into the, and the heavenly, this didn't, uh, into the earthly. This didn't escape the early, the, I would say not only just the early Christians, but many um, first century Jews. This didn't escape well, them. It, it, it didn't, it also didn't, well, it didn't escape, <clears throat> a, it escaped some, some, some of second temple Jews. It didn't escape all of them. So you read in the book of Sirach, actually, which you find in the Catholic Bible, yeah. in the Old Testament. It says this of the, of the priest uh, Simeon. It says, how splendid he was as he looked out from the tent, in other words, the tabernacle, uh-huh. as he came from behind the veil. So he's entering from behind the veil back out. And it says, like a star shining among the clouds. That's, those are messianic terms, mm-hmm. like the morning star shining on the clouds, the coming of the clouds, right? Incense. He shined like the full moon at the festal season, like the sun shining upon the temple of the king. And it says in verse 11 of chapter 50, wearing his robes and vested in sublime magnificence, as he ascended the glorious altar, which is outside, he lent majesty to the court. Yeah. So right there, it's showing you he's carrying with him the glory of the Holy of Holies out from the sanctuary to the altar. Yeah. And and what's really great about this is that you know the 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 four the four threads representing the four elements therefore we have a theology here of incarnation um in the proto evangelion of james uh which is an early christian document um they actually mention that when gabriel comes at the annunciation to the virgin mary there's an early tradition and you can see this in in eastern orthodox iconography mm-hmm. where mary is always spinning and I, it's not even it's even in the western painting and iconography that that mary is spinning and it, this comes from the proto evangelium of james where, where it was said that mary was actually one of the spinners of the temple yeah one of that, the virgins of the temple that, that mm-hmm. what she was doing as a virgin of the temple a virgin spinner was that she was she was actually <laughs> spinning um these threads yeah. to to help make the veil well and here's why that that fits in nicely and historically too because remember during the time when mary would have been young um a young child doing this in the temple, that's when Herod was restoring the temple. Mm-hmm. And so the, the veil needed to be Everything. Re- perhaps refurbished. Yeah. The vestments needed to be refurbished. And so you have this tradition from the second century of Mary knitting together the veil. Yeah. The veil, matter. Yeah. At the moment, by the way, when Jesus is becoming incarnate in her womb, yeah. she's <laughs> she's yeah. sewing the veil of the temple. Yeah. And so in the ancient world, the belief, they, they referred to the, the, the fetus in the womb as being knit, knit together. Yeah, you knit me together in, in the womb. Exactly. Right. Yep. So while Jesus is being knit, incarnated in the womb, there's Mary spinning, right. creating the veil of the temple and the vestments of the temple, which represent incarnation. Right. Yeah. And, and so now you come to John's prologue, right? Because yeah. in John's prologue, now you go and read it. Yeah. And you see that, again, like we were saying in the last episode, this isn't just a Greek thing. This isn't just like a hell in it, you know, all the, oh, the logos of God, you know. Th- this is this is very Palestinian thought. Yeah. Um, it's it's saying that, that Jesus is enfleshing, and then it says tabernacling. Right. It uses the word to tabernacle among us. Yeah, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The yeah. word there is, he tented among us, he tabernacled mm-hmm. among us. But to even say but that we saw his glory. We saw his glory, you right. see. So again, like just what we read from Sirach and the, the priest Simeon, the, the people, as he came out of the Holy of Holies and came into the courts, came through the veil, put on the vestment, came out to the people, yeah. they saw his glory. Right. This, this, this sense of the priest is deified. Well, what John is telling us in the prologue is that in the beginning was the word with the Father in the Holy of Holies, the actual Holy the, Holies, ho- right. the true Holy of Holies, beside his Father as a divine being. And he came through the veil, through the flesh, mm-hmm. and enfleshed among us and dwelt among to us. To then go and ascend well, and, just, and offer a to sacrifice. To then go to offer, <laughs> offer the, uh, the, the sacrifice. And, and, and so you have from, from the beginning to the end of not just John's gospel, but the beginning and the end of the whole Johannine corpus. Mm. The idea of Jesus, the high, the high priest, being incarnated and then returning to the glory that he had mm-hmm. with his father before he descended. Yeah. And that's what you read in actually John 17. Yeah. And, and that's the whole theme, even when you go back and look at Moses, 
that that's why his face is shining mm-hmm. after he sees God and comes out to the people. And the people are like, oh my gosh, like put Va- something on. Veil, yeah, hide <laughs> veil <it>. up. <laughs> yeah. Put something on over your face. Mm-hmm. So you see that that tradition is is nascently well, in the in the mosaic. Well, it, uh, it's, in, it's a mosaic, but it's also encapsulated not just with the, some of the, the priests like we read from Sirach, but when you when you read something like First Chronicles, um, the later chapters of First Chronicles 28, 29, what you see there's something interesting. King Solomon builds the first temple in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. and um, it says after he the, the blessing is giving and he, they dedicate the temple and everything, it says that all the people of Israel um, bowed down to worship God and the king. <laughs> so you have the sense of of this ruler priest Solomon, mm-hmm. who is king, who is a king priest, who just offered sacrifice on the altars. Yep, and then the people of God bow down to venerate God through him, yeah. actually. Yeah. So it's a much more um, uh, d- deep and layered sense of veneration mm-hmm. and worship than perhaps a lot of us are used to, or especially Protestants are used mm-hmm. to. Catholics get layers we know what's of going veneration. On here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we understand that. The Orthodox get layers of veneration. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, ch- I would challenge a Protestant to look at that and, and, and explain what mm-hmm. does that mean that they bowed down and venerated Solomon. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and we're going to talk about that as we develop th- this whole story through this episode. We're, we're going to get to um, how what Israelite religion really looks like and how it changes. But before we do that, um, I think going back to this whole thing about Jesus pre-existing with the Father and then entering into the flesh, um, the Gospel of John is consistently pointing to this whole issue of pre-existence. You yeah. know? And specifically, there's this really interesting motif in early Christianity, and we see it in the book of Hebrews, uh, see it in the Psalms, of course, in, in Israelite religion, but this whole concept of Melchizedek. And there's this this interesting part in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, talking about Abraham, he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He's like, you call Abraham father, right? But mm-hmm. Abraham was the one who rejoiced to see my day. And I tell you, he did see it. And he was glad. Mm-hmm. So, so typ- <laughs> typically, commentators will say that this uh, this refers to the time when Abraham had his son Isaac, and he rejoiced. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we would we would challenge that a bit, mm-hmm. right? Because the whole context of that verse, where Jesus is saying that Abraham saw my day and, and was glad, the whole context is actually his Jesus' pre existence. Yeah. Yeah. It's talking about his preexistence. So yeah. what does so we have to think, when in the Old Testament did Abraham encounter the preexistence yeah. of Christ? It wasn't when Isaac was born. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that that may foreshadow the coming of the Messiah, certainly. Mm-hmm. The coming of the one who was promised in Genesis three fifteen. But it doesn't speak to the preexistence of the Son. Right. And just to, you know, drive that home. I'm I'm actually just going to read the verse real quick. So you have it's John chapter 8 verse 56 um through 57. He says, "Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad." They responded and said, "You are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham?" So they get it. They get what he's, he said. They're talking about his pre-existence. Mm-hmm. They're not talking about like, "Wait a minute." So so you were a part of that whole Isaac thing? Like, that's why that that whole exegesis doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. It's talking about preexistence. Now, for those who may not be um, familiar with the story of Melchizedek, this is a very striking story. I would encourage all Catholics, go pick up your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 14. There's this event that happens. It's a historical event. It's, it's the, the War of Kings. And Abraham's relative Lot is taken captive in this whole battle between all these kings. And Abraham is like, look, I don't care about this stupid battle <laughs> between these people, but I do care about, about, about Lot, and I need to get him. So he gathers together a, a, a tribe, and he goes out, conquers, he wins, and he, he rescues his family. He rescues Lot. And this is what's interesting, is that in that time, it was customary that whatever spoils of war after you won, whatever spoils of war you had, you would offer it to the deity that helped you win the war. Mm-hmm. Abraham says... I don't want any of your spoils. I just want my family. Okay? I don't want the polluted spoils. Yeah, the only thing that we got here is that like, even my men, they ate some food along the way. That's good enough. And why? Because the spoils were coming from these pagan cultures that were, that were polluted. Mm-hmm. And Abraham said, I'm not going to offer that to God. 
and then enters in this mysterious figure out of nowhere. And he's mysterious because he doesn't show up anywhere else. Yeah. Before or after. <laughs> anywhere else. Yeah. In the, in the narratives of the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. And his name is Melchizedek. Um, and he comes out and it says that he was a priest to the Most High God. And he brings an offering, a thank offering to the Lord. Mm-hmm. And it's an offering of bread and wine. <laughs> and then Abraham, who's the great patriarch, offers to Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils. Yeah. He tithes, makes, he, tithes to he, he tithes to this man. Yeah. And it's like, who and, the heck is and, this And Melchizedek guy? is the priest that says the high God of Salem, mm-hmm. which is, of course, the area of ancient Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah. right, uh, of Salem. So it's somebody from Jerusalem who's still worshiping, like Abraham, yeah. this most high God mm-hmm. um, that's going on. So how did the earliest, earliest Christians view Melchizedek? I'll, I'll go right to Hebrews, yeah. if you don't mind, and read it. This is from the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. It says, This Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of God Most High, met Abraham as he returned from his defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham apportioned to him a tenth of everything. His name first means righteous king. And he was also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Yep. Then it says this, Without father, mother, or any ancestry, without beginning of days or an end of life, Thus, he was made to resemble the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. That's a great point because if you're if you're familiar with the book of Genesis, which is like it's like one of my favorite books of the Bible, I love Genesis. What you'll notice immediately is that all of the major players of Genesis, you know their genealogy. Mm-hmm. You know you're you're gonna be they they always mention the genealogy. When it comes to Melchizedek, he comes onto the scene. He's a major player because he's a priest of the Most High God. Yeah. Um. And, he, and, and Abraham's offering tithes to him, but you don't get his genealogy. It's a strange thing. It's, it's, it's an outlier. Right. But so, so it's, not, it's not only the earliest Christians who, who respect Melchizedek. So bef- before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah, all we really had of the tradition of Melchizedek was this Old Testament reference to him randomly. Mm-hmm. You hear of him in the Psalms. Okay. You're a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. That's in the Psalms. And then you don't really hear anything of yeah. Melchizedek. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes had preserved a tradition of Melchizedek, mm-hmm. that he, Melchizedek, would be a Messiah, yeah. that he himself would come back. And so we can, I'll read a little bit from the fragment. So this is from um, fragments one through four of 11Q13. Mm-hmm. Now, these are the, remember, these are the Essenes preserving old traditions. They say in one of their texts, For this is the moment of the year of the grace for Melchizedek, and he will by his strength judge the holy ones of God, executing judgment as it is written concerning him in the songs of David, who said, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Referring to Melchizedek, Mm -hmm. that he holds judgment. And it was concerning him that he said, Let the assembly of the peoples return to the height above them, El will judge the peoples. As for that which he said, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Its interpretation concerns Belial and the spirits of his lot who rebelled by turning away from the precepts of God. And Melchizedek will avenge the vengeance of the judgments of God. Mm -hmm. And he will drag them from the hand of Belial and from the hand of all spirits of his lot. And all the gods of justice will come to his aid to attend to the destruction of Belial or Satan. It's huge. So... In that small little fragment, Melchizedek, the, the Qumranites recognized that this Melchizedek figure shows no generation, mm-hmm. shows no ancestry, and they are prophesying that he's going to be the one to come back. And in this fragment, he's referred to as being divine, yeah. as Elohim and as El. He's referred to as El, the, <laughs> God's name. Um, so this Melchizedek priest figure in Qumran theology is going to come back as a priest, mm-hmm. carrying the name of Yahweh, being Yahweh, being El, mm-hmm. divine, and he's going to enact judgment. Yeah. So now, with that context, mm-hmm. go back and read when Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Yeah. Jesus is referring himself 
as I think he, well, he's a dad. Yeah, I think, the, I think the right reading of that text is that he's referring to himself every time he showed up to Abraham in his pre-existence. Yeah. And one of those instances was as Melchizedek. Yeah. So Prefigured. So that's an important thing. I mean, we can draw out so many examples throughout the Gospel of John, you know, where, where John is referring to... Um, this pre-existence of Christ to the to the temple theology of incarnation, mm-hmm. but this is why, folks. Like this is why when you see that the that when Christ is on the cross and the veil of the temple is torn in two, <laughs> they're talking about Jesus leaving the body. Mm-hmm. I've never bought that that whole interpretation where it's like, oh, that means that oh, the cult of sacrifice is done. It's like, no, it's not. No. It, it, it's that no. it's that it's been transfigured because Jesus has now offered the ultimate sacrifice and he has now left his body. As so his now, body is being broken and being left, yes. the, the veil, the flesh, the material. The material breaks. world yeah. is is broken open mm-hmm. and now heaven and earth have met mm-hmm. one another and have kissed one another, in mm-hmm. fact. Yeah. Um, and then again, this is why John in his gospel, you see the tomb. In the empty tomb, Jesus, all that, all that they see when they get there is two angels... Does that remind you of something? Like the Holy of Holies had two angels, two cherubim in, in the sanctuary. Um, and then you have a throne, which is the, you know, the stone that Jesus the slab. laid on the slab. Yeah. But then you also have Jesus' cloths sitting there because Jesus has removed his vestments. He's removed his humanity and he has gone down into Hades. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the Gospel of John again, you have Jesus' ascension and Jesus goes behind the veil. Yep. Like on the Day of Atonement, the priest goes into the into reality, basically. He goes into the heavenlies with the Father. And what's left? Again, two angels. Yep. And they look at the, they turn around, they look at the apostle. He's what coming you, back the way. Yeah, what are you guys all looking at? He's going to yeah. come back down the way that he went up. And see, this is all a reference it's to the all, temple it's theology. It's all temple language, going up and coming down. That's all temple language. Yeah, and that's not to say that, like, oh, John is just theologizing. It's that... Jesus is theologizing. Right. Jesus did everything exactly as it needed to be done mm-hmm. so that the Jewish people at the time would recognize yeah. what was being said by his actions. And John's priestly ears are perking up every time he sees Jesus doing something very priestly. This is why Jesus' miracles and his works and everything he does in John's gospel are referred to as signs. Signs, because Jesus is through these signs revealing the secrets of the temple. Mm-hmm. So now that we've addressed the temple theology question and what Jesus is kind of doing, and John is recognizing what he's doing, mm-hmm. um, it's important to bring something up that, um, that you know, many people aren't that familiar with, but, but um, scholars are very much attuned to this, that there is this, what we can call kind of temple tension, right? There is a tension between the first and the second temple. That's, yeah. why we, that's why actually why we f- refer to it as the first temple versus the second temple. Uh-huh. Because you have in, in Judaism... If someone was just like 101, we're getting it from Bible 101, they would say Solomon's temple, you know, he builds it, it's destroyed, you know, in the in by the Babylonians, and then there's a second temple that's built, and then Jesus, that's the the temple that yeah. Jesus enters, the second temple. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's called Second Temple Judaism is the era uh, mm-hmm. of Jesus and Christianity and everything. But what when you go just below the surface, um you realize from the text themselves that there was a tension between these two temples in yeah. Israelite religion. Well, right off the bat, um, that the that the first temple was destroyed, some something's off. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we read from the prophet Ezekiel, uh, chapter ten and eleven, I believe. Uh, he says that he sees a vision of the of the Shekinah glory of God leaving the temple. Mm-hmm. And then later in Ezekiel's prophecies, we see him prophesying about the return of the glory of God, but we're never told that God's glory returns to the temple. Mm -hmm. So we already know that something's different about this second temple that's going to be rebuilt after Ezekiel's time. Yeah, yeah. And in John's gospel, there's a constant theme where Jesus is always referring to Abraham. It's it's all it's something that's quite unique actually about John's gospel. It's it's Abraham, 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 mm-hmm. um, and 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 that's because if you if you go back to the Old Testament, you start in Genesis and work your way down to Solomon. This is the era I would say of kind of like the Abrahamic Israelite religion. Like it's very Abrahamic. What what are some of the the Let's go through some of the characteristics maybe of Abraham's religion. Yeah, I mean you do have circumcision, but you have um, multiple 
shrines mm-hmm. being put up, placed. Uh, you have the the high places, it's called. So any mounds or mountains where God is worshipped. Um, you have this terminology of of pillars being set up in the wilderness. Uh, literally pillars that were dedicated. Yeah, Abraham to, was a wanderer. God, he's, I mean, Abra- wandering, Abraham's yeah. wandering around, mm-hmm. and as he's wandering around, God is meeting him mm-hmm. in certain places. And every time that God meets him somewhere, Abraham builds an altar. Well, for not the Lord, just Abraham, but the, the people of Abraham. Yeah. Abraham's descendants the same way. Whenever God or the angel of the Lord meet them, they always name the place after God, or they they build a shrine after God there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's no geographical locale where that's where God is worshipped. Yeah. In Abrahamic religion. Yeah. And in the ancient Near East, you know, you have like ziggurats and things like that. It's that's because mountains were seen as holy places. Mm-hmm. You worship the gods on mountains, mm-hmm. um, and you sort of see this with like Moses and Sinai. Um, so Moses goes up to Sinai and that's where he's worshiping the Lord. But it's from Sinai, it's very interesting, it's from Sinai that God gives Moses the plans for the desert tabernacle mm-hmm. that's going to be traveling around, which the later temples are modeled after. Mm-hmm. So Moses goes around through the desert and he, you know, he's carrying this, thing, this uh, tabernacle around, uh, eventually gets to the point of the promised land. He doesn't go in. Joshua takes up the mantle and goes on with the tabernacle. But every single place that that tabernacle went, every time that it left, behind it, the Israelites or, or these, these, these Yahwists would build a shrine or a sanctuary to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, until finally David says, okay, bring that, tabern- <laughs> bring that tabernacle down to Jerusalem and, and establish it here. Yep. And then David's great dream was that there would be a, a real temple to the Lord in Jerusalem. Yeah. And his son Solomon fulfills that dream. And so this is sort of the culmination, we can say, of the Abrahamic religious story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So knowing that, why don't we then just take kind of like a quick virtual tour of Solomon's temple? Yeah, let's get into Solomon's temple and what it looked like. So the first thing that you're going to see here is the two pillars outside. And these pillars actually had names, yeah. Joaquin and Boaz. Yep. Which and, and most likely represented deified ancestors, right? Well, yeah. So usually to have a pillar in temples, like say in Egypt or Mesopotamia, they would build pillars and name them after ancestors or even deified ancestors. Yeah. So, so here's the sanctuary. And you can see you got the 10 lampstands to the right and to the left. You got the altar of incense yeah. in the middle. But notice all of the ornate uh, depictions of, gold. of angels yeah. and, the cherubim, and divine beings. Cherubim surrounding. You have the altar of incense there in the middle. Palm trees, flowers. What you're seeing here is a recreation of really the Garden of Eden. Yep. Um, uh, because the temple was situated like Eden was situated from west to east. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you'll notice too, as they move from sanctuary uh, to the Holy of Holies, you're going to notice steps uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. So when we said, you know, you think about the mountains and high places, the Holy of Holies is elevated here as a high place. Here's the the table of showbread. This is the bread that only the priests can eat. Mm-hmm. It was a sacred, sacred bread and depart and imparted holiness to the priest itself. There's the altar of incense. This and you see Zachariah, the steps. Right? This is where Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, would have uh, burned incense. This is all go- overlaid in gold, by the way. And now here <laughs> we're going up into the holy of holies. There would have also been a, not just doors, but a veil here, and that's the veil we were talking about with all the colors. And now you see the inner, most holy sanctuary. Comp- you can imagine how quiet this was, right, Steve? I, know. I mean, this was <laughs> it's like terrifying. This was super quiet, um, all overlaid in gold, wood first, and then overlaid in gold. You see, mm-hmm. um, obviously, symbolic figures here: the cherubim, and that's the throne of the Lord right there. Yep, that's the Ark of the Covenant where it's uh, called the mercy seat or the throne of God. I can just imagine a, a high priest entering here only once a year, and only the high priest can go into this Holy of Holies. Yeah. How frightening that would have been. It really would <laughs> have. I mean, once into. you open those doors and yeah. you, you go through the veil, it had to have been just this unbelievably mystical experience yeah. for the high priest. Absolutely. And so when the high priest comes out, we're saying he's this deified person now who goes out to the altar and there's to the altar make sacrifice right yep. and, and there's the altar to make incense or to to make sacrifice yep. and so you can see there's the outer court that's the court of the priests right outside there mm-hmm. um so then there's a subset of priests that are allowed inside that sanctuary and then the high priest only into the the holy of holies like we that's said right. so that's sort of what solomon's temple looks like i mean you can see it's overladen with gold you've got You've got celestial figures. Celestial in the words of the everywhere. great Paul Simon, angels in the architecture. Yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. palm trees. You have ornate windows. Um, 
lots of things that you have pillars that are named. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a stunning, stunning sight. So I want to read, uh, I want to go back to Qumran. I want to read from the Essenes, some other fragments that we have found. And I'm going to read from uh, fragments that are called uh, the Hol- the songs of the Holocaust of the Sabbath. So the, the Essenes would sing these liturgical songs on Sabbath days. Okay. Mm-hmm. And listen to what they're describing in these in these songs. And the likeness of the living gods is engraved on the vestibules by which the king enters. Luminous spiritual figures. King, figures of glorious light, wonderful spirits. Among the spirits of splendor, there are works of art of marvelous colors. Figures of the living gods in the glorious innermost temple chambers. From a separate fragment. The figures of the gods shall praise him, the most holy spirits of glory. The floor of the marvelous innermost chambers, the spirits of the eternal gods, all figures of the innermost chamber of the king. The spiritual works of the marvelous firmament are purified with salt. Spirits of knowledge, truth, and righteousness in the holy of holies. Forms of the living gods. Forms of the illuminating spirits. All their works of art are marvelously linked many colored spirits, artistic figures of the gods, engraved all around their glorious bricks, glorious figures of bricks of splendor and majesty. All their works of art are living gods, and their artistic figures are holy angels. From beneath the marvelous innermost chambers comes a sound of quiet silence. The gods bless the king. Okay. So that's a description, obviously, of this temple, Mm -hmm. of Solomon's temple. Now when now, the when the Essenes are writing now when though. the Essenes are writing this <laughs> let's let's show now the second temple yeah. and what that looked like Herod's temple yeah so this temple that we just showed you was destroyed mm-hmm. I mean it was destroyed by the Babylonians 587 586 BC that's right and um, and then eventually the Israelites come back and it, it's Zerubbabel who is charged to rebuild the temple and he does and he rebuilds it. And, and that's the temple now that we're going to walk through together. So, so what we're seeing now is the second temple, but Herod's version of it. So between Zerubbabel rebuilding it um, and Herod um, rebuilding it, the, the temple had uh, kind of come into a dilapidated state. It's, you know, uh, Josephus actually tells us that a lot of the foundations were sunk and broken and things need to be rebuilt. So Herod... Um, in the first century BC, goes on this campaign to restore the temple in Jerusalem, right? So he's not kind of he's not rebuilding it, but he's restoring it, mm-hmm. building up the foundations, adding a facade, all those types. He's of just things. making it more pretty, <laughs> making it more pretty. And so this temple that we're showing you now is the temple that Jesus knew, yeah. that Jesus referred to as the house of prayer. So it's still a sacred site. It's still where the sacrifices um, take place. It's mm-hmm. still a place Jesus obviously respects and loves the temple, but something's different now. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's go through this second temple of Herod. So this is the outside facade that we're looking at here. Um, And you can see that there's like four pillars, so it's not even consistent really with Solomon's, but you go through a a, a very thin curtain. You can see, I mean... (laughs) And now you've entered a very different sanctuary. You don't see the heavenly beings. Ten ten lampstands are gone. There's only one menorah. Mm -hmm. Um, You do have the the little table with the the showbread showbread off to the right, and then you have the altar of incense. You don't have the doors, but you do have the veil. Yep. Uh, That's there. Just the curtain. Just the curtain that's there. And when you go through it, all you see is yeah, a rock. So what? Yeah. <laughs> and that's Mount Moriah, where tradition holds that uh, Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. Um, the the Dome of the Rock right now in Jerusalem that's built over the Mount Moriah, that piece of rock that's there. So what you see here is is a temple that is void of symbolism. Mm-hmm. It's void of the angelic beings who were engraved, like Qumran was saying, the, the gods, lowercase gods, were engraved. Um, in the temple. So what the Qumranites are, are recalling is not the temple that they know. Mm-hmm. It's it's the temple that came before. It's, it's Solomon's temple. Yeah. So again, there's that tension in Second Temple Judaism of, okay, you're saying that's the temple, but why isn't it like Solomon's? And that's a great and question. The, and the, <laughs> right. And the Qumranites are dreaming and liturgically praying about yeah. not the temple that's already there, in, now there in Jerusalem, 
but the previous temple. That's right. Showing that tension. So it's an empty, the sanctuary is, is much more empty. You don't have the symbology of, of the cherubim and the angels and the, and the heavenly courts. You don't have the named pillars. You, you don't have the doors. Um, you do not have the Ark of the Covenant, obviously, is gone. Mm-hmm. You don't even have the cherubim guarding the Holy of Holies. It's empty. Yeah. There's nothing in there. Yeah. So what happened? So the question is, <laughs> what happened here? Well, there was a reckoning. There was a reformation. You can go just before the second temple gets built. A cleansing happened in the in in the first temple. In Solomon's temple. So Solomon's, Solomon's temple, temple. Still, it's beautiful, yeah. all this great yeah. stuff. Yeah. But what happens is the Israelites... Um, start to erect more stuff. Well, they begin to abuse the symbols of, the, of Solomon's yeah. temple. Yeah. They erect altars, it says, in the courts around the temple. They put up pillars mm-hmm. in, in the temple. Okay. Well, they also put up images. They, yeah. they literally put up images of gods, of, mm-hmm. of the nations. Yeah. Um, which, again, from their perspective, they're seeing it as sort of like, you know, gods... Uh, created beings that, you know, are kind of help him out and this kind of stuff. So they start to sort of... Venerate them. Venerate them. Which would would have been fine. But some kings come along and they see it as abuse. Yeah. Uh, First King Hezekiah and then Josiah. Yeah. You you actually have a series of kings from Hezekiah to Josiah. And and if you look at this little period in uh, the book of Chronicles and the book of Kings, you can actually, through analogy, you can see it as sort of like Israel's English Reformation. Where yeah. every time that a king comes to power, the cult changes. Mm-hmm. And it's this back and forth, back and forth, where the people want their old cult back. And the kings are like, no, it's idolatry. And they're forcing it. And and so then you have this sort of back and forth, back and forth, until finally the dust settles and you, and you sort of settle on the Josian reforms. Mm-hmm. It really is, it is actually really interesting. It's analogous. And in the English Reformation, they actually did see yeah. <laughs> King James as sort of the yeah. Josiah. <laughs> That's right. They saw him as a reincarnation of King Josiah. But, you know, with... with Hezekiah's reform first. Uh, you you find this in First Kings eighteen four, right? Mm-hmm. What does it say that he he did? Yeah. Well, he clears out the altars around the courts, um, and then he clears out the extra pillars that were put into the temple. Yeah. And then it says one thing that is yeah. So listen to this. I'll, I'll read yeah, it. Just so, read it for us. Yeah. So go to Second Kings. Eight, paraphrasing. Just seek Second Kings eighteen four. Um, it says he removed the high places. So again, think of Abraham's religion. Abraham went around making, you know, pillars, and, and Solomon and, kept and that spots. tradition that mm-hmm. there were there were still high places around mm-hmm. where where God was worshipped. Now again, what they're, what they're objecting to would be the hijacking of these high places mm-hmm. by pagan cult. Mm-hmm. Um, so he broke down all the high places. He removed the high places. He broke down the sacred pillars <laughs> and cut down the ashra. Now think about that. He cuts down the sacred pillars in the in, in the courts of the temple. If you remove pillars, you would think the whole building would come down. So that means that these were actually standalone freestanding pillars, freestanding yeah. pillars, which, which are refers shrines. to the shrines. Yeah. yeah, and and well, we and we have archaeologists have found that um, um, a temple shrine, a- Arad. Yes, yeah, and and archaeologists have uncovered this thing. Um, and in the Holy of Holies there, the pillars are still there. Yeah. The pillar shrines are, are still yeah. in the Holy of Holies there. Side note is that uh, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem was not the only temple uh, yeah. for the Israelites at this time. There's actually Solomon's temple, and then there's actually six other smaller shrines well, again, and the, temples. The, well, again, it's the, it's the culmination of the Abrahamic religion. Yeah. And so there's... The, other shrines were allowed, yeah. not just the shrine, the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah, and the one at Arad was actually recently discovered by archaeology, where, where even even the Holy of Holies is still preserved, yeah, like still there. The pillar, so. Yeah. Um, now this is the most shocking part of Josiah's or, uh, of Hezekiah's reforms. Um, so it says that he he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made <laughs> for until yeah. those days. The sons of Israel, by tradition, would burn incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. That's it's it's interesting because it's it's telling you that they used to venerate it. They used to burn incense to it. Okay, he breaks it up. Now go back in Israelite history. What is this bronze serpent? When the Israelites were wandering in the desert, they're bitten by snakes. Mm-hmm. Okay, who who I think we would interpret as demon demons, demon yeah. spirits. Um, but they're bitten by snakes, they're, they're poisoned, and to be relieved of the poison, to be healed, Moses is told to construct this yeah. serpent and put it up 
on a high place to be seen. And when the Israelites looked at the serpent, they would be healed. That's right. So it's this it's this sacred, venerable object. It's a relic <laughs> that is being kept apparently in the temple, yeah. in, in in Solomon's temple that Hezekiah believes is being abused. Mm-hmm. And so he breaks up this ancient artifact from Moses that Moses himself had created. That that jumps off the pages. I know. Like uh, it could it, it would be literally like someone taking like something like the shroud of Turin and just and ripping just, it up just or, ripping it yeah, up into or shreds cuz of, of the, our saints and just shredding them and you know turning them to ash. It's it would seem to be offensive. Yeah. Um but the, the the point here with Hezekiah is he's he's saying that well this is being abused, um, and people are worshiping the, the serpent. Yes, and so now enter in John. This is interesting because Jesus associates well, himself with the bronze serpent. Well, not only that, but it's in the same context of him revealing secrets. Yeah. So in John's Gospel, chapter three, verse eleven, again Jesus says, "Amen, amen, I say to you." We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? So then he goes the secrets. He, right. The secrets. He goes right then into this liturgical cult object. No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. So now the high that imagine now the yeah. high priest going up into the Holy of Holies and, and back down. down. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Here's John basically telling us that Jesus himself is the restoration of the serpent staff. Yeah. In the in the symbolism, the, the cross. So you have a cultic object of the old temple, Solomon's temple, that Hezekiah has broken into pieces and no longer exists. And here's John speaking the secrets of the temple, saying, well, that secret meant something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was broken down, but that secret m- refers to the coming of the Son of Man from the heavenly places, from the Holy of Holies to the cross. Yeah. And the it, Son of Man will be lifted up. Well, what's significant about this is that it's Jesus saying this. Mm-hmm. John's recording it, but Jesus is saying this. Yeah. So imagine John as the one who's form- formed by a scene theology, and here he hears Jesus He's hearing about, the first temple. He's, he's like, wait a minute, that's Solomon's temple. Yep. There's no serpent staff in the current temple. Right. Why is Jesus bringing that up? And now, and that is not a, that is, that does not escape the Sadducees and Pharisees and the scribes that he's talking to, mm-hmm. because they would be like, why are you bringing that up? Yeah. <laughs> why are you bringing up the serpent staff? Because we destroyed that on account of idolatry, right? right. We got rid of that. <laughs> and, yeah. and Jesus is Jesus is like fully, I mean, consecrating the, the the temple cult of Solomon. Yeah. See, because because the, the ancient Israelites would would look at that as almost modern day Protestants look at our symbols and say, well, why do you have those symbols? Yeah. Okay. Well, we have those symbols because we know the true reference of them. Mm-hmm. So by by John recording what Jesus has said here, Jesus is saying, yeah, well, basically, yeah, it was destroyed, but it stood for something. Yes. It meant something, and if you only knew what it meant. Mm-hmm. then it would have stood. It would have stood the test of time and it would have been here. But now I have to remind you that it stood for me and mm-hmm. the lifting up of the cross. Mm-hmm. So the same thing with, with our worship. We have the symbols because we know the reference to them. Yeah, exactly. So when you come from... So Hezekiah destroys all these things, purges the temple. Well, that's not the only one. So then you have you know a series of kings that come that restore... You know, their sons are basically wicked and they restore a lot of the pagan worship into the temple then you come to Josiah and Josiah's reforms, which are the most famous, where they find in, in, in the uh, the chambers of the temple a law book, which we now know is like the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. And he's reading the book of Deuteronomy. It was just lost in the archives for all this time. <laughs> he's reading the book, the book of Deuteronomy, and he's seeing in there, we've lost something. We've lost our, our devotion to the law. Mm-hmm. We've lost the sense of God's absolute otherness, <laughs> you know, and, and we've begun to sort of pay too much, you know, worship to these other things. And so Josiah is just burning with zeal, yeah. and he purges this temple. I mean, he just completely of, of every symbol that could be purged. Yeah, he purges it. Yeah, completely purges it. <clears throat> and it it says in the scripture that you know the Lord was pleased with this. That you know he gets rid of all of the um, all the extras that shouldn't be there. Yeah. But what's interesting is that it's not long after that that 
Well, Israel begins to go <laughs> to the other side now. Yeah. This is the beginning of the other side. So after Josiah, the temple's destroyed. Mm-hmm. The Babylonians destroy it. Um, we're told that priests flee to, the, the ancient priests of that temple flee to Arabia, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then a new temple is built. But the focus of this new temple is going to be on the law, on the commandments. Especially you think of the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me. Um, you shall not make graven images. Those types of, of things are brought re uh, brought back to the forefront of of the ancient Israelites. Yeah, and they then begin to okay. run with that. So Josiah, what what happens here is that when he purges the temple, he's doing something that God wants him to do at the time. But again, there's a danger in going one way or the other with yeah. this pendulum, as we even saw in the English Reformation. Mm-hmm. As, a, as again, as our analogy is that every time you swing that pendulum, there's there's the danger to go too far in that direction. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what ends up happening. Is that Josiah sort of sets the groundwork for an iconoclastic version of Israelite religion to emerge. What do we mean by iconoclastic? That is that like all of these other things, you know, yeah. and, and these images and pictures and depictions of, of God and his counsel and all these things that the, no, 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 God is not an image. God doesn't, you know, show up to us in anything, get rid of it, break the serp- serpent staff, the, break. Pillar, the pillars are gone. <laughs> the the pillars. other altars are gone. The other shrines are gone. They're destroyed. Yeah. Those types of things. Um, and that's why you get the temple you get in the second temple the, that we the showed. The Zerubbabel temple, yeah. which then is rest, um, renovated by Herod, but it's the same temple, yeah. and it's so bare. Yeah. It's so bare. But th- see, this is the emergence of the Sadducean sect yeah. of Judaism. It leads to the Sadducees. Yeah. And we've said this in, in, in our previous episodes when we were talking about the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in, in what? They didn't believe in the resurrection of the body, so the material of the body, that the old temple theology of incarnation of the body that we mm-hmm. that we spoke about. They rejected the belief in, in angels. Mm-hmm. They rejected belief in afterlife. They rejected All the of books things. of the prophets, which means they also rejected the idea of God's Holy Spirit moving in Israel while the temple was constructed. So it, they even rejected, in a way, the Spirit and, of God. And, and, and listen, how could that be? How, how could you <laughs> have, you know... How could you have a uh, the leading priests of Jerusalem in Jesus' day not believing in these things, mm. not believing in angels and all those things, when angels are clearly all over, you know, the Old Testament? They're part of part of the scriptures and all that. It's well, think about the world that the priests live in. Yeah, it's the world of that temple. Mm. Catholics should know this. You know, after Vatican II, a lot of our churches, right, mm-hmm. were. Um, devoid of their uh, or were devoid of their symbology, and a lot of the images were taken out. I we call a spade a spade. We went through yeah. iconoclasm. We went through iconoclasm, <laughs> yeah. and what happened to our faith? A lot of Catholics don't believe in angels. A lot of Catholics don't believe in the devil and the demons and and all those things. The same thing happened here. Mm-hmm. Where wherever you worship, the space you worship in, void of symbolism, you're going to lose that theology. That's what happens yeah. to. Uh, the ancient Israelite priests. Yeah, and, and by another analogy, you know, the way that, um, not to sound too harsh, but the way that almost like Pro- the Protestant Reformation kind of hijacks St. Paul for its own purposes like, and starts to interpret him a certain way very flatly, taking out all these other things that Catholics have always seen in St. Paul, um, the redemption of creation and all these different things. In the same way, the Sadducean and the Pharisaic sects that, are, that emerge in the Second Temple period kind of hijack Moses and they make Moses into this figure that is just like this ethics sage mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of the man who built the tabernacle, who was, sh- who was shining in glory, mm-hmm. um, you know, who obviously had a pillar of fire, like leading him through the wilderness and all these like very mysterious mystical. And, and mystical and secretive things that were happening in God's divine counsel and angels. All those things are sort of stripped um, because again, they, they're, they're moving forward with this very rabbinical, iconoclastic form of Judaism that is emerging. And it is now Judaism at this point, because with the Maccabees, uh, the Maccabean period, you have the emergence of even the idea of a Hellenism and Judaism. Well, (laughs) well, that's the thing. You see, you begin to see the emergence of what you would technically call monotheism. Yeah. Uh, Monotheism isn't really a concept for the ancient Israelites. Mm -hmm. And strict monotheism isn't really a concept for Christian Jews either. Yeah. (laughs) Which will obviously get into. So the point here is that the theology and the religion of at least the elites, the priesthood has changed Mm -hmm. from Solomon's day to the day of Herod. Yeah. And you see that tension. The Essenes are calling it out. 
The Essenes don't like the temple in Jerusalem. They don't like the Sadducees. And they're dreaming liturgically of the days of the first temple Mm -hmm. and the the celestial beings and the Holy of Holies and the Ark and all these things. Yes. So then enter in this Jesus who who comes onto the scene and John coming from this more John the Baptist uh, scene. scene theology is now looking at Jesus and what does he see? So now we can go through it. So, so, so we'll look at what was in that prior temple and what is John seeing in Jesus? So in the first temple, you have the Shekinah glory of God, the father. Remember that in, in the vision of Ezekiel, Ezekiel eventually sees the glory of God. When the Babylonians are coming, he sees the glory of God, leave the temple, never sees it come back. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and that's in Ezekiel chapter 10. John chapter 1 is the great return, yeah. right? Because he says, we beheld his glory. Yeah. The glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. What John is telling us is that the high priest has returned. The glory has returned. To Israel. To Israel. He's come back. Yep. And, and not only that, but then you go to John in Revelation 21. And you see again that the glory of God is filling this new temple it's, it's, it's really, there's no sun, there's no light, there's no need for it because God and the lamb are the light of this mm-hmm. temple. Mm-hmm. So John sees in Jesus the return of the Shekinah glory. Mm-hmm. Um, you also see the return of the Holy Spirit in the, in the ancient temple, um, Solomon's temple. There was always this whole phraseology of, and this in, in these days, the, the spirit of God moved in Israel. What, what does that mean? Go back to our prophecy episode. Prophets were speaking. So prophets were an integral part of this this temple cult. This old temple cult. And so the Holy Spirit was seen as sort of part of this this temple visitation of God. And you even see it in the book of Maccabees that like, oh yeah, and the Spirit wasn't really like around Mm -hmm. at this time. There's no prophecy Mm -hmm. moving in Israel. Well, again, you you go to John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus takes the apostles to himself and he breathes the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's the Gospel of John that has the most emphasis on the Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate right. that Jesus uh, promises to send and does send. So mm-hmm. the, the Holy Spirit returns to anoint uh, the apostles and all believers. And then in the book of Revelation, when John is seeing the heavenly temple, he in Revelation chapter 4, he sees the Spirit of God. He calls the seven spirits, the seven spirits of, God of God before the throne. Mm-hmm. So you see that, the, that again, he's seeing the, te- the new temple being constituted by Jesus, the great restorer mm-hmm. of the cult, but not only the restorer, but the fulfillment of that cult. Yep. And he's seeing, oh my goodness, this is it. Um, you see the ark. In the ancient temple, the yeah. Ark of the Covenant was there. It's not in the second temple, but John in Revelation 11, 19. Yeah, in Revelation, you see um, the heavens are open, and John says, I saw the Ark of the Covenant <laughs> basically there. And then right after that, it goes right to the woman with the 12 stars. And yeah. Catholics like to link the woman with the Ark. Of mm-hmm. course, the Ark contained or, or brought the presence of God, and Mary, the yeah. woman, brings the presence of God in her womb. Yeah. Um, so the Ark reappears you know, yep. um, in, in the book of Revelation. So there again, there again, there's the symbology returning. Yeah. And then you have, um, in the ark, you had the, the bread that had come down from heaven, the man. um, when, when Moses was with the Israelites in the wilderness. And what is Jesus saying? John 6, the <laughs> John bread of life 6. discourse. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Yeah. He, Jesus is the manna. Yeah. So again, a temple imagery. He's restoring the old cult. And remember that, that, the context of Jesus' John 6 discourse is that Jesus actually just fed a multitude mm-hmm. uh, with bread that presumably came from heaven because he only had a yeah. few a few loaves. Yeah. Um, the next thing that you see is that uh, there's fire, right? So in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 22, is this account of Solomon you know, constituting the, the the temple and he puts the sacrifices on the altar and it says that fire from heaven came and consumed all the sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Well, that fire, even in Jewish uh, uh, rabbinical theology, that fire never returned to, to Solomon or to Herod's temple, to Zerubbabel and Herod's temple. Well, in John, <laughs> in the book of Revelation, the fire is everywhere. <laughs> the fire is everywhere. And then, and then you even have outside of John on Pentecost, the return of fire upon the apostles when they're gathered for prayer. Again, this is the return yeah, and you can of think God's of, presence. Yeah, in the book of Revelation, John describes the uh, Son of Man, Jesus, uh, his eyes are a flame of fire. Yeah. Okay, He describes him that a couple times in Revelation. Um, Jesus being this, this fire figure also comes from the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, the pre-existent Christ, we could say. 
the pillar of fire followed the Israelites um, as they moved out of Egypt. And we're told that it was the, the angel of the Lord who appeared to them in the pillar of fire. Mm-hmm. Okay, so fire is returning to Israel. Jesus is that fire. Yeah. Jesus is that light. Yeah. And then this one's actually fascinating, but the oil, the oil of the temple, it says actually that during the time of reform, the oil yeah, was removed, so, right? so the Babylonian Talmud, so Jewish writings later, you know, third, fourth, fifth century, the Babylonian mm-hmm. Talmud, tells us, interestingly, that the holy oil of the temple, the chrism oil of the temple... Of Solomon. Of Solomon was hidden away under Josiah. <laughs> so that means that the, the holy oil was no longer in the second temple. Well, what, what did they use the holy oil for? Well, it was for the anointing of the kings and the, and, and and the anointing priests. in general. Yeah. The anointing of the priests. And the only way you can have a Messiah is if you can anoint... Mm-hmm. So basically, what, the, what 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 it's saying is that well, there was no opportunity then for say a Melchizedek to return as Messiah because mm-hmm. the oil is gone. Yeah, where is the oil? That would be one of the outrages yeah. for the scenes too. It's like, yeah. where's the oil, man? Where's the oil? Um, and but, it's outrage for the Christians too. But the 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 ritual itself of the anointing was actually on the eyelids, right? So they would pour the oil over over the uh, the ruler priest, uh, but then they would put oil on the eyelids. And that symbolized uh, knowledge, to, being able to, to see. see. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that in First John, oh yeah, two twenty, you have uh, John writing to the Christian presbyters as himself as John the presbyter, John the elder. Yeah. And he says to them, First John, let's see, I'll find it. Two twenty. He says to the Christians, "But you have the chrism, the anointing that comes from the Holy One, <laughs> and you have all knowledge." So there he is yeah. linking chrism, oil on the eyes, and knowledge, because yeah. that's what it, that's what it symbolized to be able to see and to understand the heavenly things, yeah. the holy of holies. Yeah, and and an interesting tidbit on the side um, about Saint Paul. When Saint Paul is on the way to Damascus to persecute the churches there, he's knocked off his horse by Jesus, and he says, "Why are you persecuting me?" But then after that whole dialogue, he says, you know, now go go into Damascus and meet somebody that I'm going to tell you. And, and, and then Paul goes, and he's blind. He gets baptized, and it says that immediately scales fell from his eyes, and he yep. was able to see. He received the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and we mentioned in our early baptism video, the question again, when people are getting baptized in the ancient world or bathing, like oil is usually involved. Like there's a rubbing down of the body with oil and then you're baptized. So again, this is this is probably a reference to the fact that Paul is now becoming a priest of this new, new covenant. Yeah. And what does he do? He goes to Arabia. It says he goes to Arabia for three years. Arabia is very significant because during this whole era of the purging of the temple, Many priestesses were of the temple, uh, many many Jewish sects. Again, actually, it's rabbinic tradition. Yeah, they tell us that many of these priests, who they would see as wicked, mm-hmm. fled to. They fled to Arabia. So this more ancient, Solomonic, Abrahamic, uh, Israelite religion tradition is in Arabia. Yeah. See, see, sometimes commentators will say that Saint Paul went to Arabia to go visit Mount Sinai mm-hmm. and receive the new covenant. It could. More be that he went to um, to Arabia to recover the Abrahamic Solomonic faith. Right. Not only are these ancient priests still there, but he went to the territory of the Chaldeans, which is the territory of Abraham. That's mm-hmm. where Abraham was from. Yeah. And so a lot of those Abrahamic traditions were probably still there. So you can kind of guess and surmise maybe that's why Paul went there. And and is it a coincidence that when Paul comes back from Arabia, what's the gospel he's preaching? The gospel he's preaching is that Christians are recovering the faith of Abraham. Abraham. Exactly. <laughs> so I, th- I think it's it's more likely to read his trip to Arabia for three years yeah. as a trip to understand the Abrahamic faith. Yeah, because because up to that point, his training had been with the Pharisees mm-hmm. in the temple. Yeah. So he I think only... that's a fun but interesting yeah. uh, take on uh, the trip to yeah. Arabia. The other thing you have in the, the Solomonic Temple is the standalone pillars, like we said, and you don't have that in Herod's Temple, but then all of a sudden in Revelation 3.12, they show up again, don't they? Yeah. So in the in John's letters to the churches, uh, Jesus is speaking through John, and he says that, I will make you... Whoever overcomes. Those who overcome. Yeah. I will make you pillars in the temple of my God, and you will never be removed. <laughs> Now think of, again, think about that. People, the, the Israelites hearing that because they know that temples were removed from Solomon's yeah. temple. Yeah. And here is John 
speaking as Jesus to the church is saying, I will restore the pillars and you're never going to be taken out. Yeah. So again, the, the idea of bringing back the old theology of Solomon's mm-hmm. religion. Um, one of the central figures of the Solomonic temple was actually the cherubim. And you walk into the Holy of Holies and what did you see? You saw the, the two mm-hmm. massive cherubim, not in the second temple. Mm-hmm. Well, you go to Revelation chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, and what do you see restored? The four, cherubim. The four, the, four, <laughs> the four beasts, the four beings, Yeah, which is an echo of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Yeah, exactly. It's actually, it's actually, the way he describes them is, the, is almost the same description as uh, Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. So you know that you have the cherubim restored. Um, the other thing is that in the Solomonic Temple, the Holy of Holies was a high place. As we mentioned when we were walking through, you went upstairs mm-hmm. to get to the Holy of Holies. In the second temple, it's all flat. It's flat. You don't go up at all. Yeah, yeah. I think that's significant because, again, um, in Solomonic religion, it was the high places, the, the, the high mountains, the mounds where God was worshipped. And so you had that symbolism in the temple of going up to God. Yeah. In Herod's temple, it's not there. It is, it is flat. Yeah. Now, when John is having his vision of the heavenly temple, what does he see? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It says, a door was opened in heaven, and, he, and it said, the next thing that he heard was, come up here. Come up. And, and you know, a lot of times um, evangelical Protestants will use this verse as sort of like, uh, see, there's the rapture, right? Like, come up here. And he's snatched away yeah, and taken up. up. But if you're seeing this as the temple of Solomon in the proper context, what you really should see is an angel up on the steps leading up to the Holy of Holies looking back at John. Yeah, one of the holy ones <laughs> looking back at John and saying, come up here. Which is interesting because John then, that means that John is in the sanctuary. And remember that when John starts the book of Revelation, he says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Mm-hmm. So he's worshiping on the Lord's day as yeah. a Christian. Yeah, that's right. Meaning again, he's in the sanctuary. He's in the sanctuary. The Christian and, idea of worship. Yeah, and the, and the other thing there about you know the steps that were there in the Psalm of Long Time and going up, it's also John mentions doors. The door. Yeah. There were not doors in Herod's temple that led to the Holy of Holies. It was just the curtain. It was just the veil. Yeah. So that John is referencing here in Revelation he saw the doors opened or the doors were opened mm-hmm. and he's going through those doors. It's an, again, reference to the first temple yep. of Jerusalem. And then in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 47, there's this really mysterious uh, description. Uh, it's a prophecy of the temple that one day there would be a hole <laughs> in the side of the temple, you know, from which water would flow out. And then the nations would come and drink, uh, mm-hmm. from, from the temple. Um, interesting. Because then in John's gospel, it's only, John's gospel. It's only in John's gospel that, that he mentions that when Jesus was on that cross, blood and water flowed out from his side. Mm-hmm. And that's not just like, oh, what a nice mystical uh, interpretation. Remember, this is also the gospel where Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And then John puts his commentary on that, yeah. and he says... Well, he's the only gospel writer, right, to, yeah. to have a commentary on it. Yeah, yeah, because in the other gospels, Jesus is accused of saying this this mm-hmm. saying, that, oh, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild in three days. But in John's gospel, John's like, no, he did say that. I was there. And when he said that, by the way, they didn't get it, but I did. And what was it? He was speaking yeah. of the temple of his body. Mm-hmm. So John is seeing Jesus in his very body as... The, the the restored temple. Well, the embodiment of the restored Solomonic Abrahamic faith. Yeah, yeah. which is yeah. why, again, that it becomes so important that, that again, the nations are coming to sort of drink from this water. Mm-hmm. Comes inside. Well, well, this is also where he says, you must drink my blood mm-hmm. to have life in you. Yeah. So you just see this. So, so I hope that this journey, I know it's a lot of details. We probably, <laughs> we probably lost a few people along the way, but but this is very, very deep all and, we, but all we, all, and, yeah, all we've had to do is give the key. Like, yeah. read John as a priest would read John. Yeah. Um, and you'll begin to unlock these types of things, this this old temple cult that's, yeah. that's there in his in his writings, in the Jonine tradition. And it's very important to, like, step back now, you know, knowing these details, now that you sort of have these keys and you want to go, now go read the Gospel of John, go read Revelation, and now you kind of see what, what he's doing and what's going on and what, what he saw in Jesus as he leaned against his breast. I mean, he saw himself as leaning against temple <laughs> you know leaning yeah. against the temple he saw them he saw him as the fulfillment of the temple itself he saw him as the fulfillment of the that ancient secret theology of the high priest mm-hmm. uh, he, they, he saw him as this Melchizedek figure 
all of that. But now, see, this is where it's very important as like kind of um, if we step back and do the Catholic takeaways, if, if we if we look at this and we say, okay, so we have Jesus. He's the high priest. He's restoring the temple to what it should be, but he's also fulfilling it in this much more grandiose way. John is seeing it. John gets it. Pentecost happens. And now those secrets that were reserved for the apostles, the priests of this new covenant, now that the spirit has come and has been poured out on all flesh, they just scatter these secrets abroad. Like, so they just, they want all the Christians to know about these secrets Mm -hmm. um, and the temple mysteries. And it's great because it shows us a couple of things, because a lot of times you'll see like Protestants be like, well, the apostles weren't priests. You know, they were just fishermen and they followed Jesus and then Jesus, you know, like, you know, raised up the humble and the lowly and sent them out into the, all the nations. Yeah, but they're priests. Mm-hmm. And this whole context shows that, that Jesus is revealing priestly secrets to them and yeah. consecrating those priests when he breathes the spirit. Well, onto well but them. even not just the anointing, right? That yeah. speaks of priesthood. Um, but also in Revelation, you, you see that the saints, the angelic beings and the saints are dressed in, um, in white there. Yeah. And what are they doing when they're dressed in white? They are praying. They are praising God. They're offering incense. You see this all throughout Revelation. Mm -hmm. So that's what the priests did in the temple. They dressed in white, offered incense, offered prayers, sang songs. John is saying that's what the Christian people do. And he's using the word presbyter when he's describing these things. John is really the first one to unite the idea the function of priest with the word presbyter yeah with the word elder and so when you when you look back and you see the word presbyter uh, protestants a lot of times will say it's not the word priest it's like well john is is associating the presbyter <laughs> with priesthood <laughs> yeah um that's what's going on here and so yeah. even in the greeks still refer to their priests as presbyter presbyter <laughs> it's Greek. Yeah, they literally still call uh, him presbyter yeah. they know what it means yeah. <laughs> um so that that is clearly being shown in, in the book of revelation yeah but um the church sort of carries this tradition of temple secrets on with its liturgy. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the things that I saw when I was a Protestant coming to the early fathers, when they would talk about the liturgy. Um, the liturgy was always broken up in sort of these like kind of two parts where you had like uh, a time where catechumens were allowed to be there. It was like for the reading of, of the writings of the apostles, the gospels, um, you know, the, the presbyter or the teacher or the prophet would give their message but then there's this transition period where it's depart, go. Yeah, this isn't for you. So you see, that in the ancient uh, Eastern liturgies, uh, they, the deacons uh, scream out, "The doors, the doors." Yeah. Well, what does that mean? It, says, it means shut the doors. Make right. sure nobody else is coming in. The, the, the ancient churches had guardians at the doors. Yeah. So that no one co- would come in, and that's why a lot of the Roman pagans could only guess at what was going on in Christian assemblies. That's, that's why right. they said, "Oh, they." They are cannibals, and they they don't worship any god, or they're eating babies, or whatever it was. The, the pagans didn't know what was going on in the Christian assemblies because those are the mysteries. That's right. Those are the secrets that are being kept by the Christian people. Yep. Yep. Um, that was the practice of the early church, mm-hmm. you, and that's why the all the catechetical sermons. Well, Here, well, let, 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 let me say this: This is why we don't get a lot of information about how the early early liturgies exactly. were. Yeah. We shouldn't expect to get that because they were keeping it to themselves. Right. Now, when the empire is now Christian, well, now the, the secret's out because right. okay, the empire is Christian. But you can't look at the early church and say, yeah, they don't worship like that. You know, they're, they're not revealing, you know, what they were really doing in liturgy. Well, yeah, because they don't want to. Intentionally. It's, it's intentional. <laughs> they don't want to reveal it. Yeah. And, 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 but when, what you'll see when we do finally move into the second century, you'll see how early it is when they start to put some of these liturgies to writing mm-hmm. which are older than themselves we're talking guys like early third century early 200s you have fully written out like what we do when we get together mm-hmm. kind of stuff <laughs> which obviously would predate them by at least a generation or two yeah. and when you do that now you're already talking about people who knew the people who knew the apostles and then you it, see, i mean it's see, so close this is this is, the, this is what john has left to tradition this is what john has left to posterity and that is to say that Jesus fulfilled and summed up all of the the ancient temple cultic cultic uh, experience mm-hmm. in himself, and and allowed those symbols to exist and take root, which would then become the Christian liturgy. Yeah. For all the symbols and the things that we use. Yeah. 
And like I said earlier, that's what it means to worship in spirit and truth. Again, we get this from John, Mm -hmm. that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, not just on the mountain in Jerusalem, not just on that mountain over there, but everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. That's a that's again a restoration of the oldest cult. We worship God everywhere. Abrahamic religion. Yeah, Abrahamic religion. And so to worship God in spirit and truth means you know the reference point of the symbols. Mm-hmm. And because Christians know the reference points, we restore the symbols of worship in our liturgies. Yeah. yeah. That's why when Protestant friends will, you know, start to say like, well, you know, that's all old testament stuff like why are you guys still worshiping with like vestments and candles and all this goofy stuff you know you guys are ridiculous like all that stuff's been fulfilled right by jesus so we don't have to do that anymore but it's like you can't spiritualize the cult and not still have a cult Mm -hmm. to be spiritualized to draw from like the reason why the ancient priests were able to have these secrets of the temple was that the rituals themselves were there as content for them to talk about. So when you come to the Christian New Testament, like we theologize based on these rituals and rites and ceremonies that we received throughout the ages. We use that as theology, the Orthodox, especially, you know, they are very much about preserving what they've, what they've uh, been given and they use it as a means of theology. It's like, well, what do we say in that Kentucky on? What do we say here? What do we say there? It, well, this is, but this is why when you empty your churches out and they may just become, become meeting halls, you lose the depth of what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. So when you, when you bring in the symbology, you are reminded of heaven and earth are meeting here. Like the yes. book of Hebrews says, heaven and earth are meeting here. And you have this, this grand deep theology of, of worship and liturgy. Yeah. You don't get that in Protestant assemblies mm-hmm. because they don't, they're not reminded of it. Right, they're reminded that they're surrounded by the celestial beings. They're reminded that they're surrounded by the saints. Why don't they don't they don't venerate saints? Why? Well, they don't see them every day. <laughs> they're, not, they're not among them. They don't they don't live with them. Yeah, um, that's that's what happened. We we saw in in an ancient cult and and happens among Protestants. Yeah, and that's why when you look at the early catechetical lectures of the fathers, you come to like a Saint Ambrose and he has like catechetical lectures. You would think that it would be like about like Jesus like came among us, did these things, like how we do catechesis to people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But he's teaching about the liturgy. That's all the the catechetical lectures are because the the catechumens were already learning the 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 gospel doctrines Mm -hmm. of the faith Mm -hmm. when they're listening to the readings or listening to the writings of the, the apostles and the gospels. When it was catechesis time for the catechumens, they were like, now we're going to show you the secrets, the mysteries mm-hmm. of what we do in the second part of and our the meanings of it, of the our... meaning of meaning of all the symbols, and that's Saint Basil. Saint Basil, yeah. in his treatise on the Holy Spirit, yeah. talks about the oral tradition that has been received down through the ages, and when he talks about what he's talk, what he's what is referred to as the oral tradition, mm-hmm. it's all these liturgical elements about what we do at baptism, about the signing of the cross, about oil, all these liturgical things. He's saying these kinds of things were passed on through only the church, Mm -hmm. orally, down tradition from priests to bishops and bishops and bishops and bishops. And that's why it's so important when when you are talking to like someone who's a Protestant and saying like, well, show me in the Bible where this stuff is. You're like, well, that's that's not why they're writing it. Uh, You know, where it is, is is like, here's a question for a Protestant would be like, well, yes, we get from the Bible that there is a meal of bread and wine, for instance. Um, But then the question is, well, what do you do with it? How do you pray when you gather together? What did that look like? Like, Well, the only people that would know that stuff are these early Mm -hmm. Christians who lived with the apostles and watched them do it. They watched them pray. They watched how Paul consecrated, you know, the the bread and the wine. Like, they watched these things, and then they passed it on, and then eventually it gets written down, just like anything else. Look, there was only one way to worship in Jesus' day, and that was liturgically. Yes. Yeah. Through rites, ceremonies, exactly. Mm -hmm. And... And mysteries. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you come to um, another, like, kind of Catholic takeaway, it's like, (sighs) this is why when we have in the modern church, like, televised masses and things like that, it's like, I mean, it's fine, whatever, but like, in my heart of hearts, I almost feel like this is a little bit inappropriate. Like, we shouldn't be showing this. Uh, to the outside as, world. As our, <laughs> as our, yeah, as this age becomes more and more secular and uh, atheistic, um, right. I, I would I would agree with you. I think it would be a better idea to to withhold mm-hmm. the mysteries. Uh, don't 
give on dogs that which is holy. Yeah. Um, that we should be returning to that kind of mentality. Yeah. That the mysteries are for the priests of the kingdom. Yeah. And for the love of all that is holy, the last thing that we should be doing is having liturgical fights in front of each, in front of the world for the entire world to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, but there's some, so those are some Catholic takeaways um, from this, this whole thing. But I think now we're ready. We can move into the second century. We can move on, you know, from, from John. But um, I hope that this was helpful for people it opens up not only John's thought, but through John and his experience of Christ opens up almost really the entire Bible and the entire narrative of redemptive history. Mm -hmm.